reminded me. There we go. So welcome to our uh, regenerative leadership call. And um, I'm excited to uh, have uh, here Suzanne's uh, presentation here. But before we go into her introduction, I would like to uh, uh, just remind you that our next call is December uh, 20th. And Marianne, with a couple of additional colleagues, uh, is going to um, do a wonderful thing. I think her title is The Power of Learning from and with Horses. So Marianne, maybe you could share a little, a little bit of a preview. It'll be December 20th at 11, uh, 11 Pacific, 1 Central. And uh, what is that your time, Martin? Six hours later, I think. Two? Depends. I don't know. Will the clocks have gone forward or backwards? I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's seven o'clock now. All right. So, seven. Marianne, why don't you talk a little bit about um, what this could be, what what the preview of coming attractions is? <laughs> yeah, da, 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 there we go. <laughs> um, well, great. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, for inviting me. And I was talking about the idea of me bringing this up with all of you. Um, it's a wonderful alignment, I think, with um, smart, creative, caring people who uh, care about kind of the confluence of nature and human nature and nature nature and, and as we call at the farm, uh, four-leggeds and two-leggeds, the, you know, the four-leggeds and the two-leggeds working together um, and connecting. So I'm going to, um, I've invited a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Heather Jeffrey and Lynn Moore, who work at Acres for Life Health and Wellness Facility in Forest Lake, Minnesota, just north of us, um, to help kind of tell a short story, help me tell a short story, and and tell their story a bit as well about um, kind of acting on my lifelong interests of horses since I was a little bitty person, and and then about maybe 10 to 15 years ago, happening on some wonderful and powerful reading and learning about leadership learning and horses, because leadership development has also been my lifelong passion. And then I had a powerful experience in a barn with a big black horse named Cole that just cemented um, kind of my belief in the power of experiential learning, really, with horses. And um, then in my retirement last year, I was doing research to connect and find a place and space to check more of that out and met some wonderful People and these two women over Lynn is the founder and Heather is her chief operating officer. This facility has been operating for over 20 years in Forest Lake, and it's all on the ground work with horses, helping in mental health and leadership, organization development, team teamwork. And so um, we're going to talk about a little bit of all of that, and then there'll be some time to actually, you know, talk and share and ask questions of Heather and Lynn because one of the amazing things these people have been doing is working with a national team that have created a new framework called ARCH. It's dubbed ARCH and it's Arenas for Change and really using a story of, frame, of story to help people um, move, in my words, from here to there, wherever he is and wherever there is where they wanna be going in terms of their um, mental health or their well-being. And um, so they're gonna talk a little bit also about this new framework that is getting great um, mileage, I'll say, so. So super, thank you so much. So uh, today, Susan Koplinger uh, is going to uh, share observations and thoughts and uh, reflections on leadership in crisis using um, the lessons from uh, George Floyd and the racial justice um, uh, pieces that have, you know, kind of uh, 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 protests that happened in the U.S., but kind of reflecting over a year later on what that's all about. Uh, Suzanne is a longtime colleague and friend and uh, has been working in the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, Suzanne, in the area of trauma and how trauma impacts our uh, our leadership, our organizations, our teams, uh, and she's been um, looking at, um, you know, how does, how can you use integrated mindfulness and integrated health and healing practices to ground you and help move you through crisis and uh, trauma. And so 
I will hand it over to Suzanne uh, to listen to her wisdom and insights uh, and uh, provoking our thinking today. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, a little bit of context uh, before I start, and, and that is that I present this information both as a person who lived through it. I live in the neighborhood where some of the worst destruction took place in the city of Minneapolis in May of 2020, following the death of George Floyd. And as a professional, I, my work at the time was with the Minneapolis Foundation and I was investing in and building networks of people who were using culturally meaningful trauma healing practices. And so I was really paying attention to how trauma and toxic stress were impacting people. And then um, we got into uh, the, the situation we got into. So the lens that I take is to understand that trauma, yes, it is an individual experience and almost everybody has some level of trauma in their lives, some more than others, but there's also this collective and historic trauma context that I think is really important to understand not only when you're working with racial or social justice, but also in this particular situation, because we had uh, people who had been affected by historic trauma, primarily black, African-American and American Indian people, but also, also a lot of our immigrant populations where people are coming from war cultures, they're carrying the wounds of their ancestors. And then they're also being impacted by the toxic stress of the day, right? So we, we don't even pay attention to this until something happens. I think the toll of accumulated or unresolved stress will come out, like it will come out. Trauma that is not transformed is transmitted. And this particular slide, I think, as I go through these, this presentation is to understand that it will come out most likely either anonymously or towards those who are closest to us. And the more jacked up we are on a consistent day-to-day -day basis, the easier it is for us to just erupt. My beautiful city in May of 2020, we had fertile soil at that time. We had four years of a highly toxic political environment where uh, ad hominem attacks, bullying, and uh, deep polarization were becoming normed. COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the economic distress had hit people hard. There was a lot of fear and anxiety in the community. Isolation was a significant problem. I mean, people who were in addiction treatment programs couldn't access their treatment. Domestic violence went off the charts. So there were a lot of sort of under the radar impacts that were taking place that people may or may not have been paying attention to and disproportionately high infection, hospitalization, and death rates among Black, Brown, Indigenous, and immigrant communities. These were also the communities that were shouldering the highest loss of employment, loss of wages, poverty, and who were impacted by eviction moratoriums. There was deep grief going on at that same time. So the, it was the perfect storm. Important also to understand in this conversation that law enforcement as a sector has a historic trauma context. There's a collective trauma understanding around what's happening with law enforcement simply because of the nature of the job, different than military, that's another conversation. But some of the data that I was looking at was that one out of five police officers around the country regularly felt angry and frustrated in their jobs, making it more likely they are distrustful of the public and will use aggressive policing tactics. Police trauma in the United States is significantly influenced by their unaddressed with police violence. So we have this, this um, industry, this whole sector of our lives, which is norming high stress situations on a day-to-day -day basis. And so those folks are really also living in their survival brain, which we will get to. And then just a little teaser, <laughs> mindfulness practices could actually be really helpful if we would but use them. A brief primer on our survival brain. Human beings, and some of you already know this, we are designed to survive. We tend to go towards the negative, like our, our inclination is to go to the potential threat, which is why the nightly news does what it does. It's why Twitter and Facebook, it's why the, the disasters get our attention because our inclination is to go there to make sure that we are not threatened. But in our ancestry, if we were hunter-gatherers, we're moving through the forest, we come across the tiger or the bear or the predator, our human central nervous system is going to jump into action and it will do things within our, our system that will help keep us alive, which has been a really important function, 
as long as we're just allowing it to do that, to just keep us alive. So when we're faced with the fear or threat, we go to our survival brain, our amygdala, which floods our body with hormones. We are suddenly geared for action. Fight, flight, or freeze become our only options. Our only options. There are variations of that. Fight can be physical aggression. It can be argumentation. It can be a lot of, it can be passive aggressive behavior. And flight can also look like withdrawal or appeasement. So different ways it shows up. But if you're in your survival brain, if you're feeling threatened, or if you're being guided by strong emotions, these are your choices. You cannot be strategic if you're living in survival brain. Anxiety is where we think the tiger is there, whether it's there or not. So if we anticipate a fearful situation on a day-to-day -day basis, our body doesn't know the difference. Our body is still flooding itself with hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, adding inflammation to our system, tamping down our immune systems and leading us to making reactive decisions. The amygdala and the prefrontal cortex are two very important parts of our brain. When you are in your amygdala, your survival brain, you're in a reactive stance. You will make decisions based out of fight, flight, fight, or freeze. You cannot access your prefrontal cortex when you're in survival brain. Your body just won't let you go there. Your body is gonna shut down digestion when you're in survival brain. Blood flow is being restricted to your limbs in case the tiger whacks you. I mean, it's a great survival strategy. You're less likely to bleed to death. Your breath gets high in your chest, your pupils dilate, like everything's happening in your body to keep you alive. You cannot go to that creative, problem-solving, compassionate place that you can regulate your mental and physical reactions, which is your prefrontal cortex. So it's a, it's a simple biological system and every human being has it. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, who you pray to, who you love, it doesn't matter. We all have this. So May, 2020, this guy, Derek Chauvin, Minneapolis police uh, officer, Sergeant, knelt on the neck of George Floyd. You all know this story. I don't need to share it with you for nine minutes. This happened less than a mile from my house. And then this happened. And this is my neighborhood. This is the Target store up the street from me. That used to be the Gandhi Mahal restaurant and the nonprofit for native youth that had just finished remodeling their building. All this happened. So I was here. And as I talk about this, it's also, an, this is an example of how a collective trauma takes place because everybody who was near this level of violence was impacted, was traumatized. There were lots of guns being shot off. There were guys in pickup trucks with AK-47s racing down my street. There were helicopters overhead. There were flashbangs. There was screaming. There was a lot going on. There were fires all around. And at one point I was outside with my garden hose because I thought, well, if the fires hop from right over there, ain't nobody coming because 911 was not being answered. So everyone was locked into this and this went on for days. So critical decisions were being made in the midst of all of this that are really important for us to understand. I don't have time to go through all of these. I'm gonna to touch on abandoning the third precinct and the call to defund the Minneapolis police because those are the two that I think uh, take us down this path, but happy to come back and you know, tease out some of these other decisions. Abandoning the third precinct, which is five blocks from my house, that was a decision that was made, I think, to save lives. I believe, and this, you know, I don't know, I wasn't inside the city hall when these decisions were being made, but I believe the chief of police and the mayor knew the level of violence that was going on that night, that if they had decided to defend the structure, people would have died. They would have had to use live ammunition and they would have had to shoot people because there was so much anger. We also know that the cops inside of the third precinct were desperately trying to destroy evidence, sensitive information. They were texting their loved ones saying, I may not make it home tonight. So they were experiencing their own level of trauma as they're throwing files in their squad cars and trying to get the heck out of there before the building is fully engulfed in flames. That was a decision that a lot of people criticized. You know, we can second guess it all day long, but it was a decision that I believe was meant to save lives, but it had consequences. Calling to defund the Minneapolis police by nine members of the city council 
was also a decision made in the height of emotions. This was my then city council representative, Alondra Cano, standing on the stage at Powderhorn Park, calling to defund the police. This became a huge national political issue, but also on a local level, people were deeply divided. So the polarization that we had experienced up to that point just grew very local and very deep. The trenches got dug deeper. The call was, we don't want Minneapolis police anymore. We just don't want cops anymore. They don't serve us, they don't protect us, they harm us, get rid of them. And we are the politicians and we will make that happen. What also was going on, this is Mayor Fry, a couple of days after all this rioting took place. And you will see how he is, he came out to face the protesters and he was shouted down. He was told to go the F home if he would not agree to their demands. So they had a list of demands. They were pretty jacked up. The whole crowd was pretty angry. You can see the hand gestures, the look on people's faces. You can see the body language here. This man hasn't slept in days. So this was also uh, part of the, the reactive decision-making that was happening. Black Visions Collective was a nonprofit that was leading some of this work within days after them calling for the defunding of the police and, and screaming at Mayor Fry, over $30 million was donated to Black Visions Collective, which I gotta tell you, the year before I was working in philanthropy and they were trying to raise $60,000 to hire a staff person. Now they have $30 million, which to me was a statement of a lot of people around the country seeing them as the forefront of a racial justice movement that needed to be supported. What really complicated things was what was happening on the ground. So as we get into 2020, armed carjackings are going up three, over 300%. And who are they targeting? <laughs> Gray haired women driving alone, hmm. Right, so there was, and they were mostly young males, 13, 14 year old kids with guns who would pull up in front of you, put the gun in your face and say, get out of the car. And some people were fighting them and they would get shot. Uh, but the, the crime rate in the city was soaring. There was so much damage done, you know, Lake Street, up and down Lake Street, up on North Broadway, over in St. Paul and University, there were sections of the city that were really destroyed. The remaining businesses were boarded up. There were charred remains of, of structures. They found a body in one building, uh, somebody who didn't get out when it was torched. So the devastation, violent crime, and the gunfire at a moment when people in the city were feeling really frightened, or really angry, layering on, layering on all their emotions. Other influential variables, Minneapolis police lost nearly 300 officers around that time, about a third of the strength. So at one point MPD was just saying, you know, if there's a body we'll come, but we don't have the person power to respond to the crime in the city. So now you can't count on the police. If your home is broken into, they used to say, if you see a suspicious person in your alley, call the police, don't bother. So residents started to feel like we're on our own. People started to form you know, little vigilante groups. In fact, the nights that the rioting was going on, neighbors were out in their lawn chairs with baseball bats trying to protect their neighborhood. There was a sense of desperation going on. But it's important, I think, to recognize how many of these cops left with PTSD claims. So go back to that earlier slide that talked about the level of PTSD and trauma in the industry of law enforcement. And now we have a much deeper problem and we have a significant financial hook that the city is on for with all the PTSD claims. That summer also the city council and an organization which was a loose affiliation of many different nonprofits formed Yes for Minneapolis. And they got a ballot amendment onto the, onto the fall ballot that said, we must get rid of the police. We're gonna eradicate the police department and create a, a department of public safety. There was very little community engagement. I remember having, having a conversation with a young man who came to my door about that. And, um, and there was a lot of emotion around that, right? So there are some people who are, this is our chance. We're gonna reform police. Law enforcement is gonna to have to listen to us now. And then there were other people who were like, what are you nuts? Carjackings are up, gunfire is up, we need police. And interestingly enough, the divisions really, the divisions that were saying we need the police were largely in black and brown communities that were, that are disproportionately um, affected by gun violence primarily. An example of reactive decision-making. 
this was January. So we're going into the next year now. We're still in these heightened emotions. The Minneapolis City Council says we're gonna cut the MPD budget by $8 million. They're, they're taking a stand. They're gonna go to violence prevention, which is a really good thing, right? But now they're cutting MPD, which has already been devastated by personnel loss. Crime continues to rise. And so now they have to react again. In June, we, we've got $5 million in overtime that needs to go to MPD. And then a few months later, we're trying to get the budget for MPD restored back to pre-2020 levels. So it was simply, to me, this is just a really good example of how when you're in a reactive pattern and you're making decision, critical decisions out of your heightened emotions, this is what happens. You, you cannot be strategic. The last point is really that the city of Minneapolis did start to invest in violence prevention and violence interrupters as a starting point. Since then, a scathing report uh, by Hillard Heinz said that the confusion and miscommunication plagued the Minneapolis, the, the officials in the, in the city. And it led to the delayed deployment of the National Guard because what happened was the, the mayor asked the governor to deploy the National Guard. The governor deployed the National Guard or called up the National Guard, but they were not deployed. So the night when all the rioting was going on Thursday and Friday night, the National Guard had been called up, but had not been deployed. Who was gonna make that decision? Doesn't seem to be clear. So there was a lot of miscommunication and confusion going on at the time. Despite having an emergency operations plan in place, the city did not follow it. The police department did not develop any, any formal planning efforts. This is important. What happened in the next point, what happened was because now MPD is, is a system that is populated with highly traumatized, really pissed off cops. They had to leave the third precinct. They're on offense now. And now the National Guard is there to back them up. So they got big weapons and big trucks. And now they're using 40 millimeter weapons. And so they're still settling lawsuits of protesters who had eyes, lost an eye to a, to a police weapon. They were just reacting. They were shooting at people who thought they were being shot at by someone else. And then those people would shoot back and now they're being arrested for attempting to kill a police officer. It was chaotic. This was going on for about a year. And then the thousands of emergency calls that went into 911 during that week, again, it's just another example of the heightened emotions that were going on in the whole city, sustained heightened emotions. I wanna draw a parallel to uh, the national landscape because the tactics of extreme emotions, this is my opinion, what we're seeing are both people on the left and people on the right using the tactics of extreme emotions to try to drive change, to try to craft policy. Washington DC on January 6th, pretty clear example of how the far right was using violence to try and get their way. A smaller example was here in Minneapolis in June of last year, when Vice President Andrea Jenkins, who is a city council vice president, Andrea is a black trans woman. She has huge street credibility, right? People know her and she was leaving a pride parade event in June and she was surrounded by far left organizers, would not let her get out of her car, would not let her leave until she signed a list of their demands. She did not call 911. She did not involve the police because she knew what that would lead to. It would lead to more violence. So she sat in the car and was held prisoner essentially for hours. She finally signed the, signed the paper and said, this doesn't mean anything. I'm not, you know, it doesn't mean anything and they let her go. So a few final thoughts. I believe that community and police violence can be traced back to this basic human central nervous system response pattern. When you are stuck in your survival brain and your emotions are driving your thoughts, your actions, your decision-making processes, like all of that, you're not strategic and you're limited in your choices. Reactivity knows no political or socioeconomic bounds. This is a human problem. It's crucial for leaders to have regular grounding practices that you can draw on in the time of crisis. I'm not saying that if Chief Rondo and Mayor Fry had good meditation practices, things would have been different. But if we have a grounding practice and we know when we're being agitated and have the tools and the skills and have that muscle memory that allow us to calm down and to take a few moments to figure out what is the most creative 
solution? How do we solve this problem, not just react to the thing that is before us? That can make a huge difference. And there are implications for organizational culture and for teamwork. I think I'll just share an example of in my own life, which I think will segue us into uh, questions. I was the executive director of a nonprofit called the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. That's when I first met Kathy Allen. And I came into that work as a survivor of domestic violence. And I thought I'd done my healing. I thought I was, oh, man, I'm, pretty, I'm good, I'm good, I got this thing. And now I'm in this job that is highly stressful. It's serving a lot of women who have been raped, a lot of violence in the community, a lot of addiction, a lot of homelessness. We did a lot of work around sex trafficking. We were in really traumatic territory. And I didn't realize that I was still being hijacked. Like my central nervous system was still hijacking me until, <laughs> until I started making really poor decisions. And then I started working with a coach. Kathy was one of those, but another a couple of teachers who started to call this out to me. How are you sleeping, Suzanne? How's your digestive system? How crabby are you on a day-to-day -day basis? And I realized I was not the leader that the organization needed me to be. I would be in my office at five o'clock trying to get out the door and problem number 472 would walk in and I would say, what? That is not good leadership. And it was on me. So I began to pay attention to my sleep, not look at, at the time it was a Blackberry. That's how far back I'm going. Uh, you know, not look at my devices, not check my email, like have me time, find more boundaries. So I started to develop a number of practices over time that allowed me to be a more compassionate leader. I could answer that same 5 p.m. question with what's going on instead of being grumpy and distracted by it. It had an impact on my organization. It had an impact on my, my leadership team for sure when we started to do this as a team. So I think there are implications on an individual level, on an organizational level, certainly on a community level, and I think on a, on a larger systems level as well. What happened in Minneapolis, no one was immune to. A lot of people left the city. A lot of people are still leaving the city. The ballot amendment to, to uh, get rid of the police department was defeated. So things have happened. Things are settling a bit. You can feel that things are settling a bit, but the implications for a whole community are still being understood. So I think that's, uh, kind of me, that's kind of what I have to say about this. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. This was an abbreviated version of a much longer session that I did for the International Leadership Association Conference last year in Geneva. Um, so I cut out a lot of stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. Wow, great presentation. So packed with so much information. Uh, I, I have a question that we asked earlier, if you would respond to it is just, uh, this being the regenerative leadership community, um, what was your th what's your thoughts on how, from a leadership perspective, that living systems or regenerative approaches um, could be applied here? Like what? And you said something to me earlier, which was really really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, the the big lesson there is that uh, we are not alone. The interconnectedness of all of our individuality, our humanity. Like there's no way that I could completely distance myself from what was going on here, nor could someone who's living in the Southwest part of Minneapolis where they didn't have any problem. They didn't have gangs going through their neighborhood breaking windows. They were okay, but it was their city as well. So, so there's an interconnected nature to this work that I think is important to understand that, that we have to understand the, it's, you know, when the butterfly flaps its wings, it snows in Montana. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that, is, that needs to be part of our analysis around leadership, that everything we do matters, mm -hmm. everything. Every choice we make makes a difference. I'll get rid of this. I, I've yeah, been, thank you. That's great, Suzanne. I've, I've been uh, reading in the resilience literature recently. Um, and there, and if you Google, you know, seven resilience practices or principles, you can kind of, there are different versions of them, but um, one of them talks about how it's important to uh, foster complex adaptive systems thinking. And what we have here in this case study is a lot of gaps in that basic capacity for designing a resilient system or 
creating uh, the context of a resilience um, system. And um, the other kind of framework I have is that um, when we, um, when, you know, the, I do a lot of work with groups and organizations and uh, this survival brain that Suzanne talked about is very present in leadership teams right now, today. And, um, and so there's a lot of, um, it's either, you can either see it in the team itself or the teams that they supervise. And, you know, how does this case study and uh, the suggestion for grounding practices, how can that be applied to the organizations that we're working in, the communities we're working in? Um, and how do we even recognize when a survival brain has taken over our teams, <laughs> either individually or collectively? And what do we do about it as people who are trying to heal the system? Thank you, Kathy. Any any questions for Suzanne before we go into some interactive conversation here? But anybody have a question for her on what she shared? Marianne? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Marianne and then Martin. Yeah, Marianne and oh, Martin. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, you alluded to this a little bit, Suzanne, um, and so did Kathy. Um, but I live in Shoreview, which is a northern suburb, and I remember watching the city being burned up at 11 o'clock that night and screaming at the TV going, where are the National Guard? Where are the, you know, and in real time, it was very scary sitting in my reclining chair in my little office up in, you know, in Shoreview, which is like 20 minutes north of Minneapolis. And yet, anyway, I just want to appreciate your comments, but I saw the implications of this defund the police in particular throughout all this election cycle with neighbors who were very, you know, if I'll say blue, democratic, you know, in, on the spectrum, but talking about all his Northern friends of Northern Minnesota. And that's what they would always go back to. And, you know, yelling about the governor and yelling about the whatever, that one sentence. So, and it struck me as, is really kind of working at this with on an individual level, but um, strategies to address, you know, community level, systems level, multi-organizational level. Um, I guess I just welcome more conversation about it and, and addressing that because, you know, it, it has such ripples. Well, and I also think one thing I will mention is that most of our systems are really good at ignoring the warning lights. Like if we're driving our car and the en fixed engine light goes on or the change oil light goes on, we do something about it but we're pretty good at ignoring warning signs. And there were a lot of warning signs at MPD. I shared earlier, when, when I was at the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, I did a ride along with the third precinct and guess who I rode along with? Derek Chauvin. This was in 2008 and I went home and I was going through some old journals and I had written in my journal that night, this guy is a Nazi. I mean, there's something really wrong with him. I observed his wow. behavior and thought, whoa, this is not the cop I want in my neighborhood. And he, there were many other warnings. So we've seen that not only within the police department, but we see it in city government. We see it in, in philanthropy. We see it all the time. We, we don't pay attention to the warning signs. And I think part of it is that we are so busy. We're so busy. Oh, I don't have time for that. And so the, the challenge I believe part of it is how do we get calm enough and quiet enough that we can notice what needs our attention? What do we need to pay attention to? And then give that attention and then take some action around that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Suzanne. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, yeah I've just been to um, uh, a conference called Adventure Mind and the idea of taking people out on adventures and getting back out in nature is a good way of getting people to reconnect and stuff like that. Um, but have you, I don't know if you've read that book, yeah. What's it called? What's oh, it called? Uh, the body keeps the score. Ah, yes. Can, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to have. A, uh, we're often addicted to these kind of neurotransmitters that are created by. You know, I mean, one of them is oxytocin that creates this. We think it's a cuddle drug, but it's actually one that also is very good at othering other people. Do you think the? Yeah. How are we going to? 
how are we going to get over that polarization? Because that in itself is highly addictive. This is why people go back to failed relationships or want to go back out with a bad girl or bad boy, because even though it's painful, the release of endorphins at that time when you go back into those situations actually provides a short amount of relief and you kind of get bored when you're not in that situation. So you create this massively stimulate, you know, this high stimulus uh, event. They'll actually be quite addictive to a lot of people. Do you think that's the case? I, I do. And I think it's also a case of comfort and uh, fear of change. It's sort of the better the devil you know than the devil you don't. It's easy to say, stay in a situation that it may not be optimum or to just continue to go on because doing something different requires us to, to change. And for some people that is just not, they're not willing to make that change. It also requires to do this work. I mean, the work that I do, which is really about helping people connect with their own intrinsic power to heal and to be as whole as they can be, that takes a commitment and it takes discipline. I'm not that good at it yet. And I've been working on this for over 10 years. So, but it is a process that we need to start embedding early in children's lives and schools all across systems. I mean, there's just huge application for this work in practically every sector. I'm gonna stop now because I see hands up. Yeah, thanks Suzanne. So yeah, Simon, and then we'll go to Laura. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Really, really, really fascinating topic. In fact, what you were just what you were just mentioning there, Suzanne, is where I, I kind of see this 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 coming from, which is a journey of healing. But how do you kind of start that journey of healing with people in supposedly positions of authority and power, where they clearly you know we're all traumatized, yeah, and you know it's, you know, it's not other other anybody. Everybody's traumatized to some degree but like actually the crisis that occurred here that i heard a nice quote about which is how people are reflecting on all the crises that we're seeing in the world right now is actually the crisis of how we respond so this is a crisis of response not a crisis of you know uh you know a, a, a racial att attack yes i mean clearly that was there but then there's been you know um you know, generational trauma and 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 a lot of trauma, you know, in in various communities. So I suppose for me the question is is, you know, yes, with children, absolutely. And Dan Siegel writes a lot about this. You know, kind of how to kind of, you know, um, you know, whole brain child, how to kind of work with children. I suppose my question is, how do you kind of work with individuals who are like these heads of the police department? You know, how do you start kind of asking them to sort of recognise? actually was there anything you could see that in the way you responded to this crisis of actually being not actually you know, resolving the crisis and how do you start them to recognize go on their own personal journey of trauma healing um and and, and yeah and and then and work organizationally you know with people to do that great question and i think it varies there's no one answer it has there has to be a readiness a willingness and an openness all three you can't have to, you have to have readiness, willingness, and openness, and it requires leadership buy-in. So I look at it in terms of entry points. What is the entry point? For some organizations, it is staff recruitment and retention. We're losing staff. How do we keep our folks? How do we keep them happy so that they're not going to a gig economy? Sometimes that's the entry point. Sometimes it's high healthcare costs. Sometimes it's, um, you know, we want to just try and find ways to help people be more creative. I knew one instructor at North Dakota State University, she was teaching, teaching architecture. And she said, if you want to be creative, you have to learn how to pay attention to your mind and your body. And the students were like, what? <laughs> Come on. And she made them do these practices. They'd go out in nature, she'd have them breathe and draw the sky and things like that. And after a while, they started to get it. Like there's a creative component there. So the entry point varies and the, the intervention must be aligned with the culture. So whether that's a law enforcement culture or a culture of an immigrant community, it has to be in their language, it has to be taught by someone who they will listen to and respect. There's no formulaic way to do this, but there are many ways to do this. And part of, the, part of my job right now, what I'm so committed to is trying to drive more resources into let the people who know how to do this work, do the work. We don't invest in primary prevention because we can't measure outcomes. That's my, my belief. So we invest in reactive strategies 
A, a good example, in the state of Minnesota in 2019, we knew they were gonna pass an opioid bill, do something about opioids. We also knew that they were gonna fund more Narcan, more law enforcement training, and more treatment. And I said, yes to all of that. But if you don't go to the pain point, like people become addicted because of pain, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, historic trauma. Like how do we begin to teach people to move through pain using generative practices that are not addictive and not narcotic? And know that sometimes you need narcotics. Sometimes you need that. So it's, it has to be fluid and it has to be responsive to, to what is available and what people are ready for. And, and the readiness, the willingness, and the openness are key conditions. Thanks, Suzanne. Great response. Laura. Thank you, Suzanne, for your thoughtfulness and thoroughness with all the details presented in a very kind of even neutral way. And I, I have my ears perked up really thinking about preventative. I, um, I'm wondering if you have any more observations you can share about the role of anxiety uh, as I see anxiety as early warning signs in a client. I'm coaching the C-suite in South America and um, and I'm seeing burnout in index uh, of three people, at least in the C-suite, who are out on medical leave. They have anxiety. So does the president. So does his father, the owner. And it is, it, I just want to look at the warning signs. So how do you notice anxiety? Where do you notice? How do you address it in teams or talk about it in a culture where you know, if you have to see a coach or a psychologist, sometimes it's like, oh, what's wrong with you? Well, noticing it in, in other people is sometimes easier than noticing it in ourselves. Um, and from my experience, introducing people to the basic human central nervous system 101, like what is the vagus nerve? Oh, the vagus nerve, it's the wandering nerve goes from your brain stem, touches all your vital organs, spreads out into your gut. When your vagus nerve is, is muted, that means you're getting signals to your brain that things aren't right. Your digestive system isn't working well. When you breathe deeply, you activate the vagus nerve. So if you start doing low belly breaths and you're breathing into your gut on a regular basis and noticing your breath, you're actually stimulating the vagus nerve to begin to talk to your brain. You're okay, you can digest your food, you're safe. And the, the biological information is accessible, right? There's no judgment about, you know, racism or cops or, you know, there's none of that. I have more, the oppression Olympics, we don't do that. It's the human factor. But just to acknowledge that it is real and it is widespread, it is widespread. And we're seeing it more now. I'm hearing a lot from teachers about and teachers, healthcare workers, like certain industries that are dealing with the after effects of all the COVID lockdowns. Mm -hmm. Teachers are short staffed. They're seeing kids come into their classrooms with more behavioral problems because of isolation, being disconnected from their peers, all that. To just understand that it is a thing and it is a thing you can do something about. Some people do need to be in clinical care and some people do need to be medicated. But there's an article, I can send it to you, Kathy, was in the paper the other day, they actually did a randomized controlled trial and said that meditation works just as well as drugs to control anxiety. That's a first. That's part of the other larger problem is it's these practices, which I would call generative practices, grounding practices, healing practices, they're still seen as woo woo. You know, they're not seen as science. You better go to your doctor. And I say yes to the doctor. I mean, yeah. Western medicine has done tremendous things, still does, but it should not be the only option for people who will not go to a clinical mental health intervention or there's taboo around it or they don't have the right insurance or they don't wanna be pathologized. There should be an access point for them in a yoga class, a ceremony, a native healer, a curandera, a shaman, a forest bathing opportunity, whatever, a prayer group. There should be opportunities for people to access calming practices in their community and that needs to be supported financially we don't have good revenue models anyway that was a long answer sorry um, thank you there was a comment in the chat if you can uh, uh share that article or we can um we can also share it in an, in our email next time uh, yeah, i'm technologically challenged if i try and find it and then get it into the chat it 
it's going to just take okay. me away. So if y'all so want to talk about afterwards, we'll, we'll send it out to you. Yeah, I'll volunteer. I volunteer to put it in there. I was actually pulling it up because of that same article last oh, week good. was you pretty fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Other other questions, thoughts, connections, comments. Lenny. Yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm listening to this, and the thought that keeps running uh, behind me, you know, we, we, is is are we creating the systems that we deserve? <laughs> I mean, these systems don't, don't create themselves, right? We're we're creating them. Where where we are the creators here, and if we don't do the work that you're speaking of, of getting to back down to root cause, right? Whether it's you know. Uh, uh, the police activity or drug abuse or, or overconsumption, any of these things, we're, we're creating this, right? I, and if we don't, I, I guess my question is, right, what do we need to do to, to create a, an environment where we can improve the systems? Great, and Melanie, thank you for putting that, or, or that link in the chat. So my personal lens on this is that we cannot change the systems, but we can change ourselves. Uh, and we can't wait for the systems to get changed. We can't wait for the systems to fix themselves. What we can do is do our own work and then find allies within the systems who wish to do their own work so they may be able to change the systems from within. But from my perspective, if I, want, if I wanted to change you know, the, the addiction, addiction medicine, I would have a lot to say about that. You know, I, I, we ran a co-occurring disorder treatment program. You know, folks in Indian country have tremendous, tremendous challenges around opioid deaths and suicide from despair. Like we don't invest in helping people heal. I can't change the way the state is funding things, but we can work with, I can work with myself so that I am a more powerful change agent and try to help those who are in those positions, young people, community leaders, folks within the systems, so that they are now doing their own work so that we're creating communities of practice and networks of folks who are moving in the same way that we understand that we need to do our own work so that we may be available to those who need us. But I won't wait for the systems to change. I acknowledge that they need to change and that they continue to perpetuate harm in many cases, but we just do our work. We do what we can every day because it matters. You know, I've been thinking about um, what kind of things should we be paying attention to if we want to create regenerative organizations and systems? It's kind of the complementary question to what you're bringing up, Lenny, which is you know, who benefits when a society or a team or an organization or a community uh, basically exists in the survival brain. Um, and, um, but this, so I've been collecting this kind of mental list of what, um, what do we need to pay attention to that we haven't paid attention to in the past? in order to create the, the kind of systems where people can thrive and the organization can thrive at the same time. And I think what Susan has presented here today is maybe one of those things. It's not just your own practice, but it's also how do you foster an environment where that practice can flourish and spread in an organization. So you begin to literally change the soil that the organization is operating from. There are a bunch of others that are kind of floating around in my brain. Um, I don't think regenerative systems can be built on people who carry a victim mentality. I don't think a regenerative system can be built um, in, with people who basically are um, uh, living in a survival brain. So it seems to me that all of a sudden leadership um, has to create conditions under which people can heal. It has to create conditions under which people can move out of that survival brain. Create and it has to create conditions where we can grow people into responsible adults. And so, that's a that's not something that's showing up in the leadership literature as uh, these kinds of things. 
one of the things, that, one of the phrases that I learned from Suzanne is um, primary care is self-care or self-care is primary care. And um, it's, it's just a beautiful you know, reminder of the power of what she's doing and what she's talking about. And also what is our own mandate here? But I know all of you work in organizations and have you ever been trying to do um, an intervention in a team and you have one person who is living in the survival brain and is really good at spreading that energy throughout the whole team. And it basically keeps disrupting um, any change from and progress going forward. And um, these are the ideas that might give us some hints about how to move through that to the other side. Other thoughts or connections or questions or contributions? I think um, that thing about, um, you know, we, I mean, a couple of other people have been experimenting a lot with taking people outdoors in nature. We do these workshops and resilience workshops and stuff like that. I think um, um, knowing kind of the opposite of that is um, uh, understanding flow strategies or flow states and how you get into that kind of stuff as opposed to and i was thinking the law of indirect effort when you were speaking early earlier um you know i've, I've just just completed this course the woodcraft for well-being kind of thing uh where basically you teach people woodcrafting stuff out in nature they get into all these kind of flow states and what you're basically doing instead of trying to you know, it's that book, it's a fuller thing, isn't it? You can't fight the existing reality, go outside and go instead and make a new one that makes the old one obsolete. And it, it, the other thing with that about, you know, someone in a victim state or who, who's bringing down the crowd, if you take them on a long walk, they can't help uh, but get filled with, you know, different uh, neurotransmitters. And as a result of that, they they change. So, yeah, change different different elements, I suppose. And notice there's been a kind of a uh, multiple presentations over this past year. Lenny kind of started us out with nature-based coaching and using nature really as a, um, a third party in the coaching relationship. And um, the, um, and I think, uh, and Chris with his experiment about taking leaders into nature um, for workshops to help them see how that impacts their way of thinking about leadership and what they're paying attention to and what they're not. And now Suzanne helping us understand really what's physiologically going on that is basically uh, driving a lot of behavior. And Frank and I had a conversation a little while ago, maybe two or three months ago about the research of that guy who basically says all of our decisions are emotionally based. So you you know you kind of put all of this together, and there's there's there are some themes that are have kind of woven through our conversations this year. But it's all we're kind of trying to orient towards this regenerative design, and we're exploring and trying to reflect on it, and then we go off and we experiment and we learn some more things, and um, I'm just. I'm thinking that there's going to there's an ongoing kind of knowledge and emotional and psychological and centering and grounding kind of set of things that we need to add to our curriculum as uh, individuals or as practitioners who are trying to transform or change the way we we uh, work and design organizations and communities. Pretty cool. Chris's computer stopped working, which is why he disappeared on us a few minutes, uh, five minutes ago. Any other thoughts before we kind of speak? Yeah, maybe the thing I want to add, and it has been said implicitly, I think, there are obviously all kinds of systemic uh, interactions going on. And uh, there's a triggering, uh, yeah, there, there's a concept like time spirits. Yeah, so the whole time spirit is coming through. And it is loaded even from centuries ago. So, so they're big, big things, and then people are being part of that. So, I, I think the entry point to be aware of your triggers uh, and the grounding is is right. But it's it's not 
only at the individual state. It, there, there's so many other things going on. Um, and to become also aware of these, uh, these forces and to call it a time spirit and uh, um, yeah, see, see individuals much more as a, as a voice of a system or so. That's the, the thing we have been advocating. I've been advocating more. I think that's also part of the picture. Um, mm -hmm. Very much so. People are basically, uh, yeah, they're expressing what's, what, what the bigger system wants them to do. So um, we've, we have about a minute left, um, and I want to leave you with a question that we came up with in our uh, prep, um, which, of course, we never broke into small groups to talk about anyway. But uh, the question was, what are your markers that help you, under, you realize that you're moving it towards a survival brain? You know, uh, do we, can we recognize them? Are we tone deaf to them? Um, and then what are your grounding practices when or if you can recognize that you're moving in that direction? And what might um, you want to strengthen or bring more discipline to or um, add to your practice to help you kind of stay grounded? You know, one of my practices is that I believe um, that I stay more grounded when I'm in connection with good people. And um, so in addition to meditation and other kinds of things, this connection that I feel to people who are doing good work is a, is a deep grounding process for me and it helps me balance. Um, but um, we were going to kind of invite ourselves into an appreciative inquiry to find out what all of your practices might be that we could learn from. Um, but we've run out of time. Um, so first of all, Suzanne, thank you so much. Thank for you. For your deep wisdom and insight into this work. Appreciate and, it very uh, much. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, really wonderful. So thank you. And uh, we'll be back to hear about um, the power of learning from horses next time with Marianne and the uh, Arenas for Change folks. And um, as they say, when our story changes, we change. And so that's what we'll do December 20th. And uh, thank you all for showing up and uh, contributing to this great conversation. So thanks. Hey, Kathy. Uh -huh. Kathy, um, someone asked if you could either repeat those questions or maybe just type them in the chat, those three questions, before we hang uh, up. I will type them into the chat, yes. That would be swell, because I was writing, but I didn't get them all either. Um, yeah, so, I have a quick question also. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. <laughs> you have mentioned there is a channel on YouTube for regenerative yeah. leadership. What uh -huh. is the channel called? You know, this is going to be horrible to say, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> but we will, we will send out a follow-up and we'll put the channel link in there when we also share, distribute this, uh, this recording. Okay. So um, Daniel or Chris, if Chris was here, he'd be able to access that. Daniel might, but he's, he's got COVID. So he, we don't know if he's listening in now or not, uh, but yes, we'll send that out to you for sure. Okay. Um, yes, it has all of our recordings from all of this year. So it's pretty cool. So thank you so much. Great to see you all. Thanks again, Suzanne. Thank you and, um, very much. Thank you.